The screams echoed through the trees. I couldn't tell if they were human or animal. All I knew was that they were loud, which meant that they were close. As I listened to the high-pitched shrieks, it almost sounded like a couple of people having a shouting match. If I had been at my apartment in town, that's exactly what I would have thought the sound was. But then the pitch changed and it took on a feral quality. I knew whoever or whatever was making the sound. I wanted nothing to do with them. The thinking you're alone in the wilderness is one thing. It gives a certain freeing feeling like you're so close to nature. But knowing you're alone and hearing the terrifying, nearly indescribable sound, it sent chills down my spine. I quickly questioned how much longer I would be alone or alive. Did those things know that I was here? Were they planning their attack? Or was it just a gathering of something, like a harmless chill session in the woods in the dead of night? Survival instinct was screaming for me to get out of there as quickly as possible. Forget the tent and my supplies, just leave. And for a brief moment I nearly listened. Later I wished that I would add. Fortunately, I hadn't made a fire yet and decided against one now. If by some miracle those things didn't know that I was here, a fire would draw them in like flies to whelm, something that I didn't want to be in. Even though the screaming was still going at a fever pitch, I quietly snuck into my tent and sipped it shut. As if some flimsy material would magically keep at bay whatever beasts were raging out there. Searching through my pack, I found my Swiss army knife and kept it firm in my grasp as I lay down on my sleeping bag. I didn't dare settle in for the night. Sleeping through being attacked by a wild or whatever's and torn to shreds could be bad for my health. As I lay there eyes wide, listening to the horrible sounds that seemed to come from everywhere, they suddenly stopped. At first, this was a relief, but when the sound stopped, so did all of the noises of the forest. It was as if somebody had hit the mute button on all of nature. I heard a loud thumping sound that sounded like drums beating faster and faster until I realized that it was my heart. Trying to calm myself so I didn't have a heart attack on the spot was a challenge. I tried to think of calm blue oceans and sunrises, of beautiful things that had nothing to do with the situation that I was in. Apparently I did my job too well. I don't remember falling asleep but I remember waking up in a panic. Jumping up, I looked all around for the beasts that were coming to get me, when all that stared back at me were the contents of my backpack and the four walls of the tent. I allowed myself to take a few deep breaths. It was morning, the sun was up, and the birds were singing. I took both of those as good signs, and being alive was a bonus as well. It was decision time. Do I pack up and cut my trip short by two days or do I write off last night's incident as a rare occurrence and not worry about it today in the daylight as the sun's rays bathed me in warmth? It's funny how fear manifests itself so much stronger at night. Last night the forest seemed like the most horrifying place that I had ever been and today it looks like all the beauty of nature is spread out before me. I couldn't imagine anything bad happening in such a picturesque place. As I looked out over the clearing in the woods, I saw a large dark spot that was moving towards me. I dove into my tent and emerged with a pair of binoculars. Peering through them, I saw the spot was a bear and it was headed my way. So much for nothing bad happening in nature. My plan of action was to hide and hope it went away or turn down another path before it got here. That plan didn't work out so well. Within 15 minutes, I could hear it snuffling around the campsite, looking for something to eat. I hoped it wouldn't be eating fresh camper. The can of bear spray was firmly in my hand with my white knuckles clenching it. Having it was one thing, but using it was another. That was my last resort, a spray and run. The sniffling got louder and I could hear the bottom edges of the tent being pushed in by a large nose. My knuckles grew a little whiter as I followed its progress along the edge and around the tent. And then there was a pause, a dreadful pause. The kind of pause that horrible decisions are born from. 
I was contemplating my own horrible decision when the sniffling started again, this time leading away from the tent. And breathing a cautiously optimistic sign of relief, I opened the tent flap just enough to see the bear lumbering off into the woods. Again, I held a silent vote, just like the song said. Should I stay or should I go? I had only been camping up here once before, but I didn't remember it being this dangerous. Maybe I just got lucky last time. Not wanting my luck to run out, I packed up my tent and got ready to leave. The sun was already high in the sky, leaving me just a few hours to hike out what took me a full day to hike in. I looked for bear tracks to see which way it had left, but the ground was dry so there was nothing to see. Crossing my fingers, I headed out on the trail, hoping that it had gone some other way. It was easy going, making the terror of last night fade even more. I still kept a wary eye for the bear though. No use in getting so caught up in nature that I ignore her dangers. After around an hour of walking, I found a large rock on the side of the trail then decided to take a break. Pulling out a granola bar and a bottle of water, I looked around as I snacked. There was a clearing in the woods and a rough path leading to it. It wasn't any official path, just one that happens when a lot of feet go the same way and trample down the foliage. There was a faint whiff of smoke coming from the clearing, but I couldn't see exactly what was causing it. My curiosity wanted to see what was there, but my common sense said no way. In the end, curiosity fought dirty and said the smoke meant that there had been a fire and the ashes could blow into the trees if the wind picked up and it caused a wildfire. It was a good point even though the wind was uncannily still at the moment. I took a quick look around to make sure the bear wasn't sneaking up on me, and then started down the narrow path. The trees blocked out some of the light as I headed down the path toward the clearing, making me literally descend into darkness, and it wasn't a good feeling. My eyes darted around looking for anything out of the ordinary and I slowed my pace. Then suddenly the trees opened up and daylight shone brightly on the clearing and the remnants of a fire with a wisp of smoke still rising. Whoever had made it had been dangerously uncaring about the safety of the woods. The fire sat right in the middle of a patch of grass with no ring of stones surrounding it. My ire rose at the carelessness of this person. I found myself wishing very bad things on them when I noticed something else. There were splotches of red all around the fire. It was like somebody had spilled red paint all around. It was strange, why would somebody bring paint out here in the middle of the woods? I stalked around the other side of the fire looking for the answer to this mystery, and unfortunately I found it. There was something pale sitting just outside the burned grass of the fire. It was next to a splotch of red. I bent down and moved the grass to see more clearly. Picking it up, I saw that it was a severed human toe. I dropped it and stood up like a shot. The red splotches made sense to me now. They weren't paint, they were blood. A chill ran down my spine. I suddenly felt very alone and surrounded. My eyes darted all over the clearing and into the trees as I did a slow circle searching for whatever was about to attack. As I searched, I saw the red splotches let off into the woods in the opposite direction of the trail. Curiosity tried to get me to follow, but I told it to shut the heck up, and I hightailed it out of there, my head on a swivel searching for threats. And just as I was about to reach the main trail, I literally ran into the bear. I had been so busy watching behind me for whatever might be chasing me that... I didn't see what was right in front of me. It turned to face me, showing its red teeth, and then it stood on its hind legs, dwarfing me and roared. I wished that I had worn the brown pants because I soiled myself in fear. I was so terrified that I didn't move. I mean, I couldn't. I was paralyzed. It dropped back down onto its front legs and approached me, teeth bared. I knew right then that it was responsible for the screams and the dismembered toe. The only thing I couldn't figure out was the fire. I had never heard of bears being able to start a fire. This was unfortunately the last thought going through my head before being eaten. It sniffed and took a step back. 
If I had known dropping the load in my pants would save me, I would have done it the night before. As I looked into the eyes of my dad, it wasn't looking back at me. It was looking past me. I wasn't sure what kind of trick this bear was pulling. It wasn't like it had to fool me or anything. It had me dead to rights. Curiosity made me turn and follow the bear's gaze, and I instantly regretted it. Standing near the clearing was a monster. It was like nothing that I had ever seen before, and it stood on hind legs at least eight feet tall. It had the horns of a deer, but the face looked like a deer's skull with no skin on it. Its shoulders were covered in what looked like a cloak made of another animal's skin. The bear let out a deep growl full of menace. I took the opportunity to back away and allow the bear a clear path to its adversary. It glanced at me for a moment and then started toward the monster. As soon as it was past me, I dropped my pack and ran down the trail with every ounce of speed that I could muster. It didn't matter that my car was miles away. It didn't matter that there was no way I could sprint all the way there without collapsing and having a heart attack. But just then I heard the fight. The growling, roaring, slashing, knocking trees down. Sort of fight that would have been awesome to watch. From inside of a bunker with two foot thick concrete walls. Just me alone without a rocket launcher to defend myself. There was no way that I was sticking around. I ran for a solid ten minutes before the stitch in my side told me that I had to at least slow to a walk. I didn't dare to stop. I knew that I had to keep moving. It was my only chance of surviving by some miracle. The sounds of the fight echoed throughout the trees, making it seem surreal to hear it, and then hear it echo back again. It sounded like the fight was slowing down. I hoped that it would have lasted for a while longer, maybe whichever one won would forget about me or be too tired to track me down. My walk had become a limp. I was nearly out of energy and had a mile to go to the relative safety of my car. I mean, surely by now I could take it easy. As the thought rolled through my brain, the sounds of the fight had ceased. The fading echo was all that remained. I wondered if which one had been victorious and comforted myself that the victor was surely enjoying the spoils by feasting on the fallen adversary. But in the back of my mind, unease grew. What if it didn't forget me? What if it was following me right now? I found myself walking a little faster, much to the pain and chagrin of my legs. The silence that fell in the aftermath of the fight was disconcerting. The animals around me that had been chattering away, suddenly falling silent, was alarming. I started jogging, each step a new exercise in pain. There was no doubt that I was being followed. The footsteps behind me were getting louder by the moment. My car was in sight though and I was almost free. The footsteps behind me were very loud now and I knew that it was right there, but I didn't dare look back. Run, don't think, just run. My thoughts screamed at me. Even my curiosity had no desire to look back. Ten steps from the car, I dug in my pocket looking for my keys. For a brief and terrifying moment, I couldn't find them. And then I dug a little deeper and came away with my prize. I hit the remote to unlock the car and dove into the driver's seat. The engine had just roared to life when the monster appeared. I threw the car in reverse and stomped on the gas, whipping around and making the monster miss, crashing through the windshield. I jammed it into drive and floored it as the monster recovered and started after me. For a long, horrid moment, it seemed to be catching up to me. The road was gravel and had several potholes in it, and I found myself swerving to miss the biggest ones so my car wouldn't bottom out. But by doing so, the monster had gained ground. It was almost within reach of my rear bumper when I slid sideways onto the main road. Once on the pavement, I floored it and watched with satisfaction as the monster fell behind. I breathed a sigh of relief as I relaxed and settled in for the ride home. It wasn't long until I was pulling into my driveway and parking. My head fell back against the headrest and I was tempted to take a nap right there when my nose reminded me of the state of my pants. Walking in empty handed was a mixed blessing. I had left hundreds of dollars in equipment behind but at least I was alive. 
My shower called to me and I strapped, threw my pants and underwear in the trash and then settled into the longest most rewarding shower of my life. After drying off, I threw on a Metallica t-shirt and a pair of shorts and I came back out to the living room and settled in to watch a movie. Horror was out, I knew that I would have nightmares for weeks about my ordeal, so I decided to watch an episode of Wipeout. The three episodes later, I found my eyelids fighting gravity and exhaustion. Heading to bed, I turned out the lights and stepped up to the living room window. Looking out over the lights of town, I sighed seeing the trees of the park far in the distance and knowing that I would never visit there again. But before I turned toward my bedroom, something caught my eye. It was impossible. I rubbed my eyes just to be sure. The monster was creeping out of the woods and coming straight toward my house. As I watched, it looked up and saw me. Our eyes locked. Mine full of fear, it's full of menace. I ran through the house, making sure that every door and window was locked. After that, I went to my bedstand and pulled out my Snubnose 38, checking to make sure that it was loaded and grabbing a handful of extra bullets, shoving them in my pocket. Running back out to the living room, I looked out the window, but it was gone. Pressing my face against the glass, I searched the front yard, but it wasn't there. For an instant, I wondered if my imagination had been playing tricks on me. I went to the kitchen window and looked into the backyard. It was dark out and I couldn't see much. Reaching for the light switch, I hesitated and not wanting to see it suddenly appear in front of me. But I had to know if this thing was real or not. I would rather than that I was going crazy than ever see that thing again. Flicking on the light, I took a half step back. Nothing was there. I scanned the entire backyard and all the way to the woods that bordered my property, but there was nothing. I shrugged and was about to go to bed when I heard it. My foot stopped on the first step and I turned back toward the door. Someone or something was scraping against the front door. Feeling like I was in a trance, I was drawn to the door. Leaning up to the peephole, I closed my eyes and breathed a silent prayer that nothing would be there. And my prayers were answered. There was nothing out there. As tempted as I was to just accept this audible hallucination, my shaking hand reached for the doorknob. The distance between my hand and the door seemed to fade, like one of those scenes in a horror movie where the camera zooms in while going backward. I turned the knob and held my breath while opening the door. Nothing was there. I released a breath that I didn't realize I was holding. Looking around, the yard was empty, just the evening mist clinging to the lawn. My imagination had gotten the best of me. I turned to go back inside and saw the door and the door frame had long scratches on it. My blood froze. It was real and it was here and it had tracked me down. As terror gripped me, I saw a flash of brown fur an instant before it charged at me. In sheer desperation, I fell back into the door just as it hit the door frame. Its antler slammed into the door frame, sending splinters flying as it struggled to get loose from the destroyed wood. I lay on the door watching in grim fascination, stunned by the fact that it had missed gouging my eyes by a mere fraction of an inch. The doorway had saved me. The same doorway that was rapidly disappearing under the monster's onslaught. I regained myself and ran. As I darted through the living room somehow, I had the pressure of mind to grab the house phone and dial 911. As I headed down the basement steps, slamming the door behind me. 911, what's your emergency? I'm being chased by a monster who's trying to kill me, I said vaulting down the stairs. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I'm being chased by a monster who's trying to kill me. Are you talking about a person? No, what don't you understand about the word monster? I shouted. Alright, it's my duty to inform you that prank calls will be reported to the police and you could face charges. Fine, send the cops. Maybe they can fight off the monster long enough to put me in cuffs. The line disconnected. Ah, son of a... I said as I heard the monster stalking around inside the house. I squeezed myself into the far corner between the wall and the oil tank and tried to be as quiet as possible. 
Barely breathing, I listened to its measured steps as it crept from room to room. The floorboards complained with loud creaks, telling me this thing weighed considerably more than me. I heard it turn toward the stairs and thought about making a run for the cellar door that led outside when my phone rang. Hello? I whisper screamed, trying to be as quiet as possible. Is this the person who just called 911 about a monster? Well, yes, who's this? There's a pause as I heard the footsteps change direction. I'm from another agency. Could you describe the monster for me? So you're from one of those three-letter agencies that always say they don't spy on our phone calls. Could you describe the monster for me? Well, it's huge, at least eight feet tall covered in fur, and wearing the fur of another animal over its shoulders. Oh, and it has antlers like a deer. I heard a sharp intake of air. Where is it? I gave him my address. I meant where is it in the house? On the first floor and I'm in the basement, but I think it's coming down here. Just then I heard the basement door open. Uh, gotta go. I whispered and then hung up the phone. The basement stairs groaned under the weight. I hoped that the wood would collapse under the weight and it would fall, snapping its neck. No such luck. The stairs creaked as it continued to the bottom. I had to duck in this basement so that I was sure it was on all fours to keep from getting tangled up in the rafters. My heart pounded. I struggled to keep my breathing quiet so I wouldn't give away my position. The puffing of the monster's breathing was getting closer. I wanted to close my eyes, but I had to know when it came close enough. Instead, I reached into my pocket and pulled out the gun. Aiming it at the corner, I waited. The skeletal snout appeared, but I didn't shoot. The shot would only bounce off of bone. I wanted to hit something more vital and hope that I might somehow survive. The rest of the bony skull made its appearance and went by without noticing me. Next came the neck and the rest of the body. I wasn't sure where this thing's vital organs were, so I held off, hoping that it might not notice me at all. Those hopes were dashed when it sniffed and then whipped around and stared right at me. I took that as a sign to shoot it in the chest. The gunshot was deafening, especially in such a closed space. My ears were ringing so loud that I could barely hear the monster screaming and tearing my oil tank limb from them, trying to get to me. I fired again, trying to hit any part of its body as oil flew from its thrashing around. We were both covered in heating oil and yet it still kept coming. Three more shots didn't even slow it down. It was so close the muzzle of the gun was nearly touching it. I shoved the barrel in one of its eye sockets and pulled the trigger. The flame from the exploding gunpowder set the oil on fire. I don't know if it was that or the bullet bouncing around in its skull that made it shriek even louder. Flame engulfed its screaming form, making it look like a demon coming from the underworld. I ran out of the basement through the outside doors, bursting out into the open air and disappearing into the night. I was so relieved that I didn't notice right away that I was on fire. The oil that had splashed on me had ignited when the monster caught fire. I tried to push my way out quickly, but the monster had shoved the tank closer to the wall, pinning me. The fire devoured the oil on my clothes and my bare skin, making me scream in agony as I tried in vain to get away from it. And this was it. I would die this horrible, agonizing death trapped in an inferno. The monster would get its revenge and not even know it. Maybe once it had extinguished its own fire, it would come back and devour what was left of me, like a well-done steak. I must have been hallucinating. I could have sworn a cloud enveloped me just before I died. I awoke in a white room with an annoying beeping sound that wouldn't stop. There was a smiling face sitting in the corner staring back at me attached to a man that I had never met. How are you feeling? He said, stepping over to the hospital bed. Am I dead? Not yet. It was close, though. If we hadn't gotten to you when we did, you would have been a shish kebab. I tried to lean up, but pain put me back in the bed. Yeah, you're not going to be taking any hiking trips for a while. You've got burns all over your legs that'll need some time to heal. I'm never going hiking again. 
Are you the guy that I talked to on the phone? Yeah, do you mind telling me the rest of what happened? He said, pulling out a pen and a notepad. Sure. Since you saved my life, it's the least that I could do. He pulled his chair over and got comfortable. What happened to the monster anyway, I said. He hesitated. It got away, didn't it? Yeah, he said, lowering his head a little. We lost the trail after it had extinguished itself, but don't worry, we'll find it. I didn't comment on my opinion of the competency of government agencies out of respect for the man who had saved my life, but suffice it to say I wouldn't be sleeping very soundly once I got back home. Uh, where would you like me to start? I said. The beginning is always a good place. A week later, I walked out of the hospital, literally. The doctor said that I had been very lucky. Because I had been sweating, the oil didn't stick to my skin. And since oil and water don't mix, it was literally floating on top of the sweat on my legs. Even though I did receive some burns, they weren't nearly as bad as they could have been. I guess I'm just one lucky guy. Now I get to go home and barricade myself in my house, hoping that thing forgets about me, or better yet, that it had died from its burn injuries. When I got home, I walked up to the front door and saw these scratches on it. I took the steps, one at a time, looking at the door frame where it had gotten stuck, trying to gouge my eyes out. I opened the front door, slowly expecting it to be waiting behind the door to nab me, and drag me off into the forest to do unspeakable things to me. I realized my white knuckles from the doorknob then quickly shut and locked the door. The splinters and sawdust covered the carpet, along with muddy, inhuman footprints. After doing a quick walkthrough of the house to make sure that it wasn't there, I grabbed the vacuum and started cleaning. I had just finished when a knock at my door nearly sent me through the ceiling. Peeking out through the people, I saw the man who had saved me that night and opened the door. What are you doing here? I said. Came to check up on you. Mind if I come in? I stepped aside and motioned for him to enter. He stepped in and scoped out the room. It's surprisingly clean for having a wendigo nearly destroy it. I just got done vacuuming. He eyed me up and down. Of course you did. He said, plopping down into a comfortable chair. So, how goes the hunt? I said, sitting in my usual chair. He shifted in his seat. It's going well. So you've captured it then? Well, not exactly. Killed it? He shook his head. Then what have you done? Well, I saved your life. And I thank you, but what have you done lately? Well, that's kind of what I'm here for. How would you like to join our team? A team of what? Cryptid hunters. I looked at him with sheer disbelief. Ah, pass. You haven't even heard. I don't want anything to do with that thing, I said walking into the kitchen. But you're the only one who's ever survived an attack. I wondered to myself if that was true or if he was just trying to make my pride force me into a bad decision. Pass, I said. You wouldn't be going alone, he said, getting up and following me to the kitchen. There are two other cryptid hunters that would be along, plus me. Not interested, I said. There is a reward for its capture, and you would get a share of it. No deal, I said, starting up the stairs. He seemed flustered. You would get to carry a big gun, he said. I paused halfway. How big of a gun? Big. I thought about it for a long moment. All right, I said and then continued up the stairs. Great, then let's go. I paused. What do you mean let's go like right now I just got back home? We need to strike while the trail is fresh. Fresh, a week old is fresh, he shrugged. The guys and your equipment are in the truck. Can I at least grab a shower first? There was an odd look in his eye. No need, we'll be out on the trail. We stood in a silent stare down for a long moment, and then I shrugged and came back down the steps. So how much money will I be making, I said. He smiled. Enough. I followed him outside, turning at the last moment to lock my front door that had seen better days 
and it looked like a stiff breeze would blow it over. He grinned but said nothing as we approached the truck and climbed in the back doors. The two men in the front merely nodded when we got in, and then the driver started the truck and drove away toward the woods. I wasn't having pleasant memory flashbacks when we pulled into the same trailhead that I had barely escaped from just over a week ago. I had to wonder if I had had some head trauma they hadn't noticed at the hospital, or if Mr. Three-Letter Government Agency had drugged me without my knowledge to get me to come back out here. I was tempted to run as soon as I opened the door, but I didn't want to look like a coward in front of these guys, even though I didn't know them from Adam, and they each had a good 50 pounds of pure muscle on me. We stepped around to the back, and Mr. Three handed me a backpack that was so heavy it nearly pulled me over. You're gonna be good with that, he said, noticing my struggle. You can take some stuff out if you want. Nope, I'm good, I said hefting it onto my back and somehow managing to keep it there without my knees buckling under the weight. Next, he handed me a belt that had all kinds of stuff on it, including the big gun. It was a revolver, but the cylinder was so long I wondered if it would shoot rifle shells. Just remember, we're trying to capture and not kill it. That was never a part of the deal, I said. It is if you want the big payday. I stopped in front of him. What if I want revenge? He looked me up and down, sizing me up as if seeing me for the first time. Well, then you should go home and leave the hunting to us, he said and then stepped around me and started down the trail. The second hunter followed him, but the third stayed behind him and stared at me. Aren't you following them, I said. I'm the rear guard. I go last and watch everybody else's back. So you're waiting to see if I follow them or tuck my tail between my legs and slink home. Yeah, pretty much. I looked from the trail to the road and back again, and then slumped my shoulders and started down the trail. So, what do I call you? I said over my shoulder to the hunter beside me. He was silent for a moment and then softly said, You can call me Ray. My mind shot back to an old comedy routine that I had seen on one of those classic TV shows. Alright, Ray, I guess it's going to be you and me for a while, because I know I won't be catching up to them with what feels like a Buick strapped to my back. He told you to take out whatever you felt you didn't need. You ever heard of this thing called pride, Ray? He shook his head ruefully. Unfortunately, yes. Does that mean I can count on you to continue to make stupid decisions? I stopped and turned to him. I think the answer is obvious. Great, he said with no small amount of sarcasm. We started down the trail and I must say I did pretty well for around a half hour. And when I say pretty well I mean trudging, heaving and moaning at the incredible amount of weight on my back as we slowly followed the trail through the forest. To make things worse it started to drizzle out. It didn't take too long for him to have. Enough, he said. Just stop right here. I obeyed and nearly fell over backward as gravity grabbed the backpack and tried to hurl it to the ground. If it wouldn't have been for Ray catching me, I would have hit the ground hard and rolled around like a helpless turtle, unable to get up on my own. He lifted the pack off my back effortlessly and set it on the ground. He dug through it and started thrusting things toward me. Here, he said, shoving a handful of granola bars toward me. Put these in your pants pockets. Next, he handed me a flashlight and some extra rounds of ammo, a water bottle, and a rain poncho. I took the poncho out of its wrapper and put it on. The first few steps I took sounded like I was wearing a snowsuit. Everything that he had given me to stow in my pockets made some kind of noise. The granola bar wrappers rubbed together. The rounds of ammo clinked and clicked. Even the rain poncho made noise when I took a step. I thought we were trying to sneak up on this thing, I said stopping in my tracks. I sound like a freaking one-man band. I don't worry about it, he said avoiding my eyes as he set the pack off to the side of the trail and stepped past me. I'm sure the rain will cover your sounds. I looked up and only a few drops landed on my cheeks. The rest was just a fine mist. Narrowing my eyes, I watched as Ray walked ahead of me on the trail. 
I hadn't known him for long, but it was easy to see that he was hiding something. Maybe he didn't want to scare me so I would keep on with the search. In any case, I rested my hand on the gun in its holster for comfort. Don't go pulling that out unless you have to, I said without looking back. Remember, we're here to capture, not kill it. Uh, maybe you are, I said. He stopped dead in his tracks and turned toward me. Look, I get it, you're scared. I would be too if this was the first time that I was hunting something like this. But you have to do things our way so nobody gets hurt, you understand? He hadn't said it in a threatening way, just a matter of fact. But I still found myself taking a step back. What if that thing decides it wants to hurt someone? He looked me in the eyes. Well, then we stop it, he said. And then he turned and started down the trail, not even checking to see if I was following. I sighed and fell in step behind him, finding it much easier now without the heavy pack of doom weighing me down. I still rested my hand on the gun as we walked, though. The forest was quiet, the animals weren't making much noise, and the wind was still. I didn't know if it was the intensifying rain or something else that seemed to spook them. Ray, I heard someone whisper. He stopped and whipped around on me. What? He said, looking at me. I didn't say anything. His eyes were full of suspicion, but he continued along the trail. It wasn't long until we heard the sound again. Ray. His eyes instantly shot to me, but I held up my hands in surrender and shook my head. He scanned the trees, looking for where the voice had come from when we had heard it again. This time, he was able to focus in on where it had come from. He started toward it without a second glance at me. Wait a minute. Are you sure you want to follow this? I whispered. Of course, he said. But his eyes had an otherworldly quality to them like he had been hypnotized or somehow was under the voice's spell. He stepped forward slowly but not carefully. It was as if he were being drawn and started walking into the woods in front of me. He had almost disappeared when suddenly the creature appeared as huge and real as ever. Its skin was burned all over its body and hanging loosely in some places, like it was about to fall off. It was much more terrifying than the last time that I had seen it. Even the hide of the other animal that it wore as its shawl seemed melted to its shoulders. It slashed Ray across the throat in one lightning fast motion. All I saw was a spray of red before the creature picked Ray up and started off into the woods. Before I knew what was happening, my gun was in my hand and I was firing it over and over at the beast as it escaped with its prize. I fired the gun empty but kept squeezing the trigger on empty cylinders. Finally, I realized I wasn't shooting anymore and emptied the shell casings out, digging into my pocket to reload and dropping bullets in my haste. Once I finally had it reloaded, I slammed the cylinder shut and looked for the creature. To my surprise, two trees came toward me. I aimed the shaking gun toward them when one of them said, Stop! Don't shoot us! It was so shocking to hear a tree talk that I obeyed its command. They continued to advance on me when they stopped a few feet away, and one of them ripped its top off, revealing a human head. It was the agent. Give me that gun, he said with an outstretched branch. Absolutely not, I said, holding it away from him like a kid withholding a toy from a parent. Where have you two been? The other agent removed his treetop as well. Oh, we were staking out the area. You two were supposed to bring it to us so that we could capture it. Bring it to you, how were we supposed to do that? He stared at me for a long time, looking as though he wasn't sure of what to say. I finally got it. You used me as bait. You know, once that thing got my scent, it would follow me. He shrugged. It was as good a plan as any. Except it caught on to your little plan and now Ray is in harm's way and it could already be dead. What do you mean, dead? He said. I described him being taken with a special emphasis on the blood spray. He stared at me silently. We need to regroup and think of what to do next. What to do next is to find this thing and put as many holes in it as possible before it has Ray for an afternoon snack. 
I said, holding up the gun for emphasis. I told you that we're bringing it in alive. Even at the cost of our lives, I said, looking from one agent to the other. My point seemed to sink in grudgingly with both of them. We still need to find it, the head agent said. After we find it, we can debate killing it or not. Fine, this way, I said, starting in the same direction I had seen the creature and Ray disappear. Who died and made you boss? He said, following as quickly as his tree outfit would let him. I turned and faced him as serious as a heart attack. Hopefully not Ray, I said, and then turned and resumed in the direction that I had seen them. I didn't turn back to see if they were following, but I could hear trees rustling behind me. I hoped that was them or I was in trouble. As we walked, my senses were on alert, watching and listening for the creature in hopes that it wouldn't pull another sneak attack. Thinking back to the brief battle, I wondered how many of my six shots hit the beast and how many might have hit Ray. I couldn't be that careless in the upcoming fight. I would have to take a better aim and be patient. Not only was there Ray to think of as a potential victim, but also the two clowns behind me dressed up as trees. We weren't on any trail and that made it rough going for me. My legs were still sensitive and I had rushed out of the house in just a pair of shorts and a Metallica t-shirt. The rain poncho that I wore gave a little warmth but not as much as I would have liked. When we left, it was nice out, with the temperature in the mid-70s, but once the rain had started, it had dropped 10 degrees. That plus the fact that we were walking through rough country, avoiding thorns and all kinds of plants that seemed like they were designed just for the annoyance factor. I can't imagine how those two behind me were doing in their ridiculous tree outfits. I turned to check on them, but they were gone. Slowly looking around the forest, I searched for them, but they were nowhere to be found. With their outfits on, they could have been right beside me and I wouldn't know it. And they also admitted to using me as bait. Maybe that's what they were doing again. I wish that I would have just stayed home and ordered a pizza and watched Wipeout on TV, and then fallen asleep on the couch. That would have been a good first day home from the hospital. Instead, I was freezing in the middle of the woods all alone. And I had lost which direction I was going, so now I was officially lost in the woods too. Great. The rain was coming down harder now and I decided to look for some kind of shelter and to regroup. I walked forward, looking not for the creature but anything that I could use to hide from the rain. A cave would be great as long as nothing was in it. A fallen tree that I could sit under would do as well. In the end, I lucked out. I hadn't gone far when a cave had appeared up ahead. Instead of blundering inside, I circled around and watched the entrance for a while, until I was cold enough to ignore the potential danger and get out of the rain. Standing in the mouth of the cave helped a little by getting me out of the rain, but I was still freezing. I turned and looked inside. The huge maw of blackness stared back out. Even using my flashlight didn't tell me much about my impromptu rest stop. Hanging out near the entrance was not advised. I would have to find someplace else once the rain had stopped. But as I looked up, a flash of light, followed soon by a crash of thunder that made the world shake, told me the rain wasn't about to let up. As cold as I was, it would take a special kind of crazy to go exploring this cave that could hold any number of wild animals who had no problem eating humans. I hoped one of them wouldn't be the creature. What did the agent call it? A wendigo. Against every survival instinct, I shone my light into the cave and started walking. It was big, at least 12 feet from the ceiling, but the walls were smooth, almost like it had been dug with a machine. And there weren't a lot of rocks and debris like you would envision in a cave. It seemed like somebody had made this cave and concealed it as natural. But why? There was nothing out there in the middle of the woods. Even the cave itself was far off the beaten path. As I was wondering about the nature of the cave, I heard a sound behind me. Slowly I turned, hoping that the creature hadn't snuck up behind me like it did with Ray. But all I saw were two trees standing on either side of the cave. You've got to be kidding me. Like no one's going to notice two trees suddenly growing in the middle of a cave with no sunlight. Neither tree moved, but I was sure one of them made a shushing sound. 
and I shook my head and continued into the cave. The further I went, the more the flashlight struggled to ward off the dark. It was like the light was overwhelmed by the darkness. As big as the cave was, I came to a spot where it opened up into a larger room. The ceiling was so far up it was hard for the flashlight to reach. As I scanned around the room with the light, I settled on something over in the corner. The closer I got to it, the more I wanted to turn around and leave. I stepped up right beside it and pulled my shirt collar up over my nose to cover the stench of death and decay. It was Ray, or what was left of him, strung up on a rack. Both his legs were gone and the huge puddle of blood under him and didn't give me hope that he had survived. I reached up and felt for a pulse anyway. My hand went right into the opening where the creature had slashed his neck. There was no pulse. At least I didn't see any bullet holes in him. That made me feel a little better. I hung my head and turned to report to the trees following me when I saw a sight that made me question reality. The creature had returned. It was in a life and death battle with the tree. It had picked the tree up and was holding it near the top. The tree was kicking and punching the creature as though its life depended on it. The creature seemed confused at first, but once the tree delivered a well-placed kick, the creature decided that it had had enough. I swung the tree around effortlessly like a baseball bat and smashed it into a wall. The sickening crunching sound it made on impact were a combination of wood and bone breaking. The tree instantly went limp. But the creature wanted to make sure. It threw the tree at the other wall, leaving a red splotch on impact before collapsing to the ground. The second tree hadn't moved the entire time. The creature stepped close to it, suddenly suspicious. It reached out when I made my decision to act. I pulled out the gun aimed at the creature's head and squeezed the trigger. I had never fired a 44 Magnum in a cave before and I never will again. My ears were ringing so bad that I couldn't hear anything. I saw the tree holding its ears as well as the wendigo. Its mouth was open and I imagined it was screaming but I couldn't hear it. I don't know what happened. If something in me just snapped or I realized that I was about to end up like Ray, I ran up to the wendigo while it was disoriented by the gunshot, stuck the gun under its chin near its neck and squeezed the trigger five more times. The top of its head exploded with a geyser of bone and red. It screamed so loud that even I heard it through my hopefully temporary deafness. I didn't hang around to see what was going to happen. I ran toward the cave entrance, grabbing the uninjured tree and pulling him out with me. It only took a moment for the tree to get the point and run along. Once out, he guided me back to the trail and took the top of his tree disguise off to talk to me. I told you I wanted that thing alive, he said, looking and sounding very unhappy. Why don't you tell Ray and the other agent that you just lost how that thing's life was more important than theirs? He glared at me. Oh, don't give me that luck. I just shot a Wendigo at point-blank range. You think your little glare is going to frighten me? He continued to glare. Okay, you have two choices here, I said. Either drive me home or give me your keys. He finally allowed his shoulders to relax and started walking. I'm not giving you my keys, he muttered. We walked back out in silence. Whatever his deal was with bringing the creature in alive, he was serious about it. I was just glad the whole ordeal was over. And do you think it's dead? I said. He ignored me for a few minutes and then finally said, I don't know, I've heard some amazing stories about how they recuperate. Wow, well, gee, thanks, I feel so much safer now. I said as we rounded a corner and there standing in the middle of the trail was a huge bear. We both froze. What do we do? Shut up, he said back. We stood as still as humanly possible as the bear sniffed the air and lumbered up to us. For some reason it looked familiar. Could it possibly be the same bear that fought with the Wendigo over a week ago? It had some scars and scratch marks on it that looked partially healed. It stepped up to the agent and stared at him. Perhaps it had never seen a tree partially eat a human before. That's what he looked like with the top of the outfit off. Like the tree, it half-digested a human the way a snake devours its prey. And then it stepped over and sniffed me. Its eyes grew wide with what I would almost call fear. 
But that couldn't be right, now could it? I mean, why would a bear be afraid of me? It turned tail and ran off into the woods without looking back. What was that all about? I said. Do you really want to question it, or do you just want to get out of here? Get out of here, I said. My feet already double-timing it down the trail. We were within sight of the car before we slowed down. Both of us were breathing hard from power walking the entire way. I was sure that it couldn't have been easy for him in that tree suit. I think I may have figured it out, he said as we arrived at the car and he fished out his keys. Do tell, oh wise one, I said. It smelled the Wendigo's blood on you. What difference does that make? Think about it. If you're enough of an alpha to have Wendigo blood on you, the bear probably didn't want to mess with you. I thought about it and it made sense in a way. Just as we were about to leave, we heard an inhuman shriek off in the distance. He turned to me with a gleam in his eyes. Oh no, I said. You take me home right now that I don't care if you go try to hunt this thing down and end up getting eaten. All right, he said pouting. We drove in silence, each of us in our own world of thoughts. Every once in a while, I couldn't help glancing in the rearview mirror just to be sure. When we arrived at my house, I got out and turned to leave and then stopped. Why was that cave man-made? I said. What makes you think it was man-made? He said with a nervous chuckle. Well, the walls and ceiling were too smooth. They seemed rough enough to me. So you're not going to tell me that there was a secret military base nearby? You enjoy your recuperation, sir, he said, handing me a business card. If you ever have problems like this again, give me a call. I dropped the card on the seat. I think I'd be better off on my own. You don't protect your partners very well. I walked inside my house without looking back.